Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this is um, actually, I think we have now been doing our Quick Bites webinars for a year. Um, we did our first one in response to the government's food strategy when it came out a year ago, um, and we're revisiting that topic today. And um, so extremely delighted that um, Bob is joining me today. So this is Professor Bob Doherty, I'm sure um, many of you know him. He's a professor of agri-food and dean for the School for Business and Society at York University. And we work together on um, Fix Our Food, which is one of the big research collaborations which the government's funding at the moment and which Bob is the um, principal investigator for. So Bob has got his fingers and tentacles in all, all lots of areas of work around food, both locally and nationally and internationally, actually, I'm you know, Bob. <laughs> yeah. um, and you've been keeping a quite a close sort of watch on what's been happening in the follow up to the national food strategy. So it's really great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to start by um, just uh, stepping back, I suppose, and setting a bit of context. So we um, in just so everyone sort of the, the COVID period sort of makes your timelines go a bit weird in my mind anyway. Um, so it was July 2021 when Henry Dimbleby published the independent review entitled the National Food Strategy. Um, and then in June 2022, um, the, uh, on the 13th of June, in fact, so um, <laughs> a year ago yesterday, um, the government published its what it called the government food strategy, which was the official response to the independent review. Though I think uh, many would argue it didn't have a strong resemblance to the independent review, but there were obviously some elements that were taken forward. Um, and I think what well, is interesting when I was preparing for this conversation, certainly I got sort of got the senses that we started with a big program of propositions mm. and analysis that came from Henry's report. It sort of got whittled down in the government's response and we're left a year later with a subset of that, this sort of winnowing away at the sort of level of ambition, um, mm. the sort of strategic approach to thinking about the direction of the food system and we're sort of left with I think a rather piecemeal set of things which are currently going forward um but I'm interested to hear your views I mean how do you sort of reflect on that period what do you would you say the direction of travel is yeah and first of, and, and thank you for Anna for inviting me uh, to the to the webinar and also thanks for everybody for participating I guess I'd go back a little bit further uh, to actually the development of the national food strategy and other work that was going on at the time, it really raised the awareness of food systems and the importance of looking at food as a system. And also, it was an we've we've gone through an historic period for food systems policy. If you think about it, with the 25-year environment plan, Brexit, the national food strategy, the the agricultural bill, it's never been. You know, it's an historic time, I think, for food policy. And he's put food front and center, and that's been a good thing. And I do think it's worth reminding people that the National Food Strategy document was a very, very comprehensive piece of work. Uh, it was well evidenced, and policy is all about evidence, you know, providing evidence to make good decisions that are based on the system. But also what people do forget about the National Food Strategy uh, developed by by yourself and Henry was that it also included a lot of public dialogue and that's really really important for people to, to to remind people there was public dialogues all over the country and I was privileged enough to go and present at two of them and you and and there was people from all demographics people who were experiencing food insecurity people who were farmers people who were working in markets and supermarkets and there was an appetite for change that's what I would say uh, and that came very, very strongly. And I really welcomed the document. I thought it was a really, really solid piece of uh, evidence analysis. And then we had the food strategy. And I was actually quite disappointed uh, with the food, food strategy uh, because it wasn't really ambitious enough. If you look at all the problems in the food system and the cost of, for, in terms of planetary health and dietary ill health, I thought the food strategy could have been more, more ambitious. But there were, were a, pil a number of pillars of hope in there, like the horticultural strategy, the health disparities white paper, the, the you know, school food 
uh, school catering revolution. You know, there was a number of things in there, good new uh, public buying standards for food procurement. There was lots of in things in there that gave you some hope that there would be some change. However, and I agree with you, we've seen a, a kind of um, uh, U-turns, a uh, number of U-turns. We've seen a stalling. We've seen things that get repackaged into other investigations and other 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 reports. And I, I, I feel as though uh, the, the, the really the government has lost its way. Um, mm. I, I mean, the, the, there's still a strong appetite in the civil service for change. If you speak to people in DEFRA, they really, really want, they're quite frustrated as well. So is, so is academia and so is civil society. But if you look at what could be achieved, and at the same time, it's a shock to me because all the statistics, all the trends, all the problems in the food system are getting worse and uh, not getting any better. So that vulnerability is increasing. So I can talk more about why I'm disappointed and, and talk more about the, the U-turn specifically, if you like. Mm -hmm. And also, I can talk also more about rising food inflation, uh, increasing reliance on imports in, from precarious uh, areas, so you know, and also on so on and so forth. So we can go into those details as well. Yeah, I mean, I think on that on that last point, it was interesting that the sort of um, the government response was to to Henry's report was sort of reframed through the lens of concerns around food price inflation because obviously the Ukraine war had started relatively recently. We were starting to see those prices climb. But I'd argue a year later, we're in a much worse situation than we were at that point. Obviously, food price inflation is now extremely high, still at 19 percent, um, mm. even though world food prices have been falling now for quite some time. We've got now the additional shock of the the dam disaster in um in Ukraine, um, which is adding further worries. We've got some Brexit controls, which are going to start to be introduced later this year and early into next year, which are causing concerns around food price inflation. Um, and in interest, and then of course, we've had the period where we had shortages of certain fruits and, uh, or vegetables, particularly on the shelves. Um, and what, but what we seem to have got now is, is this sort of a even narrower focus to try and fix some of these issues short term. There was the Prime Minister's summit, um, uh, and and a kind of knee jerk into thinking now about price caps, which obviously on the face of it, from a consumer perspective, potentially offer some potential relief, but obviously come with a, a set of potential unintended consequences and and very mm. difficult to anticipate the extent to which we should expect that pass through to come through to our yeah. inflation from what's happening globally so i think um i mean it, it's the very reason that the issue was reframed a year ago mm. seems to have been not you know has sort of really underscored the fact that that set of measures which were set out a year ago really just haven't done what we needed them to do in terms of preventing some of the consequences of what we're seeing now sure, um, sure. but let's come on to the yeah go on did you want to add yeah and just, on, just on that you're quite right and just on uh, food security we're now there's no um i think the 37 percent 37 percent increase in emergency food parcels compared to the peak of the pandemic um yeah. so you've got all these cascading in in, in you know um uh, interacting factors uh, not only the price of food, but wage deflation, price of housing, all interacting to to really. And and I don't know whether you're aware. You probably well, you you will be aware that I did some did some uh, uh, work last week on the number of food banks, both independent and um, trust or trust food banks in the UK compared to the number of supermarkets. And actually, food banks are now the second largest store, uh, food store in the United Kingdom. So if you look at the number of independent and also number of uh, Trussell Trust, it's 2,811. Uh, and there's only 2,837 Tesco stores in the UK. Uh, and there's 1,407 Sainsbury stores, 600 uh, Morrison stores and 400 Asta stores. So if you add all those together, food banks are still a, bit, a bigger number. Oh, and I, I remember such don't a know interesting were... statistic. I'd heard the one about um, more food banks than McDonald's, um, but that's really interesting. That's another another scale new stat that I've not heard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, I, it's not a new stat yet, but it could be after this webinar. 
but but the, uh, the 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 thing about it as well is that back in 2010 there was 35 food banks so uh, it, you don't have to you don't have to go very far back in history and i remember david cameron criticizing gordon brown in a speech uh, back in 2013 saying uh, under the little labor government food banks started to uh, uh, you know, started to rise in the, in the UK, and it was a failure of the previous Labour administration. So I think it's quite quite interesting that we're, we're you know, that it, yeah. it, it, it is shocking, really. Yeah, I mean, and our our food insecurity tracking shows exactly the same. I mean, a doubling of levels of food insecurity over the past year. We're about to um, put a new survey into the field, actually, just so everyone's aware that there'll be new data coming on that very soon. Um, so let's move on to some of the areas that I think we were hopeful were going to, sure. to be important steps in the right direction this time last year, and which we're, I think, a little concerned about now. Um, should we start with um, horticulture? Mm -hmm. Tell us what you think about that, and then I'll move on to the health disparities white paper. Yeah. Well, I was excited, quite excited by the government food strategy, horticultural strategy, because I remember from the national food strategy, uh, you know, if we if we were to tackle, um, you know, health, um, you know, dietary ill health, we needed to increase our fibre consumption by fifty percent, and also our fresh fruit and vegetable consumption by by thirty percent. So I was really, and at the same time, we know that we import fifty six percent of our vegetables, and we also import eighty four percent of our fresh fruit. So I was really, you know, I've been I've been calling for a kind of rethink about horticulture for quite a while, uh, for about five or six years, and so I was excited about this. But the government's decided to U-turn on it. I think there was an announcement during May saying that they were going to, you know, look at innovation, look at automation. Uh, um, but actually what you do, you know, obviously to tackle that increase in consumption of fiber and and stimulate and incentive, you know, stimulate it and encourage people, you need to, we need to produce more. Uh, or, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables in the United Kingdom, and the industry was really, really, um, you know, there is capacity there. They're really keen on doing that. If you look at fresh produce daily, they're so disappointed with uh, with the U-turn on the horticultural strategy because they they feel as though they could have really contributed to the nation to 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 rectifying some some of the vulnerability in the UK food system. And remember, those imports come from quite increasingly precarious areas in terms yeah. of in terms of water stress we saw in the winter the kind of climatic impacts on on in, on southern europe in terms of um leafy green production so yeah i think it's uh it's 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 not interconnected they lost the they seem to have lost their way in taking an interconnected systems approach to tackling something at the production end as well as improving consumption and dietary 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 health and remember Dietary ill health costs the UK economy seventy-four billion pounds. So mm. I don't know, I don't understand why they haven't taken a more realistic approach and costed in the actual economic cost to the National Health Service, to lack of product, to to lowering of productivity of the workforce, and obviously that health disparities gap as well, uh, which is quite frightening. So yeah, those are my, that's my yeah. thoughts on that. Tana. I mean, I think I think more broadly, the, there's what what the independent review tried to set out was an integrated program of work for government uh, around food system change and what has happened is that the work has now splintered back into departments so actually you've got DEFRA not thinking about a horticulture strategy which is around you know production and consumption but rather you've got them focusing on a sort of slightly narrow agenda of thinking about well what's the successor to the producer organization scheme for growers of fruits and vegetables and and if people are interested to delve into that more I did a quick bites with Jack Ward immediately after the Rishi Sunak summit where we discussed the horticulture work in in more details so that's somewhere to go in dive into a little bit more detail if people are interested mm. let's move on to um well the health disparities white paper which which basically has never materialized and I think this feels like the biggest sort of gaping hole really in the follow-up to Henry's to the National the Independent Review. Um, uh, and I mean, I think interestingly, in the last, is it in the but in the last month when we've seen Keir Starmer's speech about um the health mission that Labour is setting out, I think to some extent uh Labour is 
grabbing at least part of that agenda in setting yeah. out what it wants to do around around health disparities and prevention yeah um which is you know good that they're, they're setting that bar high but i think um we need to we've got obviously a set of immediate issues which are facing communities around the country mm. um which are not necessarily being grappled with though i gather that the leveling up department is starting to look a little bit more seriously at some of these issues from that perspective which is okay. interesting yeah. um but what's your what's your take on this i mean obviously there has been the um major condition strategy which is getting off the ground Im important as that is it's not really focusing on the prevention and the sort of inequalities focus mm -hmm. that i think we had originally hoped would be there yeah. um though i think the health select committee is um, doing its own inquiry on some of these issues, so there'll be opportunity to, for them to be raised in Parliament in a more systematic way. So that's, I think, an opportunity for people to engage. But what do, what do you think about yeah. that whole element? Well, well, when when Steve Barclay announced his major condition strategy in January um, about you know six kind of um, uh, problems that dietary ill health creates. I was really disappointed not to see uh, a reference to health disparities. Um, I thought that was something that was promised in the government food strategy last yeah. June and also very well covered in the national food strategy as well. So I was really disappointed uh, with that. And I did write a letter and I got no response uh, to, to, to that. And, and I do think, again, if you look at um, if you look at the kind of health life expectancy and the gap between if you, you know, I was speaking to the National Health Service uh, um, Integrated Care uh, Board a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying in East Grimsby, compared to Harrogate, there's a 25 year difference in healthy life expectancy. Yeah. And I do feel this is really corrosive, this, yeah. this, this health, uh, this the disparity, uh, which obviously food plays a really crucial part. It's really corrosive to our society. And, um, and, and it's a, it was a real disappointment not to see it referred to and not to see it front and centre in. And I do think that when you, when the National Food Strategy was launched, I really liked the tax mechanism, the tax mechanism, the 2 percent levy on high fat sugar salt foods for companies that are producing those foods uh, to get more to use that in a creative way to get more fresh produce and fresh fruits and vegetables and more community programs into disadvantaged areas. Uh, but for some reason that was misunderstood. It was portrayed by the media and by certain politicians as being a tax on, on the consumer. And it was not really wasn't a tax on the consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you wouldn't have expected companies to pass it on to the consumer. That's not the that wasn't the spirit or the principle of it. And I noticed last week that in the Guardian that Danone, the chief executive yeah. of Danone, was actually calling for this tax mechanism um, to tackle some of the. And I think tax. I think tax is actually a useful useful tool in the coherent food strategy. Um, in you know, in terms of policy. Well, I think uh, thinking about that mix of tax and subsidy, which are going to actually move the get this seesaw effect in favour of healthier food being the most affordable, appealing, and available. Mm. And obviously, the where the fiscal incentives are within the system are really, really important for creating that tipping of the balance in favour of healthy and sustainable food. So, I agree, and I hope that um, these issues are going to be grappled with um very seriously by all political parties when they're writing their their manifestos um i mean the other thing i think we could touch on is the um food data transparency partnership which um we have engaged with a lot we yeah. this was set out to cover environment animal welfare and health in the paper last year in the strategy last year and we saw this as a really important sort of um, step towards, you know, requiring uh, large food businesses to report sales-based metrics around yeah. some of the key measures, which will tell us whether um, diets are transitioning in the right direction and the role that food and, and help to underscore the role that food companies have in supporting their customers 
to move in that direction. So sort of sales based metrics. Yeah. Um, and the environment work is, is up and running, which is good news. Um, the animal welfare is not. I think that's been set to one side and the health working group has moved really from a, a, a mandatory approach, which is what was set out this time last year to a voluntary approach to these metrics, which feels to me like a really disappointing step backwards. Obviously, there's valuable work to be done on aligning metrics, but we've sure. seen so many voluntary initiatives in the diet and health space fail because they've been voluntary um, and you've only get a few companies engaging and you don't create that create that level playing field, which a mandatory measure can, can yeah. offer. So yeah. um, it's, it's disappointing to see. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I was um, I picked up on the mandatory versus the voluntary, and I also picked up on. I guess these things are there is a lack of data. Um, you know, that's why these transforming UK food systems research programs are so important. When you when you when you try to get data, even at a regional level, it's really difficult to to. It's in different places, and you have to bring it together. And I think that's what the idea of the food data partnership was, so we could see it at a systems level and make in you know make more informed evidence based uh, interventions. So the very fact that they've, they've taken a while to get off the ground. And, and also they're very, very, seem to be very, very um, preoccupied with uh, green, greenhouse gas emissions, which is really, really important. But there are a lot of other things like the biodiversity depletion, uh, health, um, um, you know, in, in indices and indicators. So bringing that together in a more robust way is definitely what is needed. So again, I, I, I would say I was disappointed, although I think there is some, you know the, the the team in the in in the food data partnership. You know the board se seem to be enthusiastic and have an appetite, but I guess it's a question of resources and sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I and I think it's very important for people to engage with the process for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and because it's this point about consistency of metrics is really vitally important, and at least it should progress that conversation um, substantially, which needs to happen. So that's 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 mm. important. Um, chinks of light. Well, I think probably just one other thing to briefly mention one of the things which are a bit disappointing. It, the health, I, I, just, I want to mention it because today there's a debate in Parliament, um, a bill being read by Emma Lorba around Healthy Start. It's mentioned in the paper a year ago to say that it's the Healthy Start digitisation was happening and that was a good thing and it was going to increase access yeah. to Healthy Start. In fact, what we've seen is the digitization process has led to a fall in, up, in uptake of the scheme because a lot of people fell out of the scheme at that point. And mm. what Emma Law Buck's doing in her bill today is calling for um, the auto enrollment of Healthy Start, um, which is an obvious thing to do. It's obvious also for free school meals that people that are eligible should be automatically enrolled on the schemes and then they can opt out if they don't want to be part of it for, for whatever reason. Sure. Um, so we're hoping that we'll get some a good airing today in Parliament. And if people are interested, we've published uh, constituency level data on uptake on our website today. So people can go and have a look at what their mm -hmm. constituency looks like and whether they're in a low uptake area or, or not. Um, but let's move on to some of the more positive things. But what would you I'd like to ask, because there's a lot there were lots of good commitments around research this time last year and I think we've seen some really good progress in that area what's what's your view on that yeah I mean the, obviously the transforming UK food systems program um, from the strategic priority fund uh, allocated 47 million pounds um, to a range of programs you know to a centre for doctoral training to uh, four consortia programs which one I lead and then a raft of other programs as well so that's a positive thing and a lot of good work going on uh, and, and, and particularly in things like free school meals which I can come to if we have time at another at another point and also looking at things looking working with farmers on more regenerative approaches working um, you know with businesses on, on, on more social and environmental approaches and learning from each other so it's a lot of good work there's also six million pounds has been invested in research over the next two years in terms of uh, more sustainable healthy diets for all and some community interventions uh, which is which is very positive uh, and increasingly there's more funding for you know innovation uh, as well through Innovate UK uh, through DEFRA as well in in the farming space um, but it's not really taking I don't think 
apart from the Transforming UK Food Systems Programme, not necessarily taking a systems approach. Uh, it's been kind of, you know, splintered down into, into specific bits. And the real job, I think, for UK re research and innovation and also for government is to join that up. It's mm -hmm. making sure that it's joining up all that thinking. I mean, I play a part in that because I try to work across the policy uh, yeah. academic academic boundary. But there is a responsibility, I think, on both academics and policymakers to continue the conversations, to join things up. And the great thing about the programmes as well is that they, they, they quite heavily involve civil society, which is really, really important. So I think there's a real appetite in civil society, academia and policy to actually do more, I think where the where the inertia is is at political level, and we did need to we need to continue to be advocates. We need to continue mm -hmm. to be to lobby, and I think organisations like the Food Foundation are so important, play such an important role in making sure these issues are front and centre uh, for everybody. Yeah, as do many of the organisations who from people that are on listening in today. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm kind of quite excited about the fact that there's been this level of investment in research and really from a food systems perspective. And now these randomized control trials, which are getting off the ground under the banner of salient. Um, I think what's exciting is that they are going to be really starting to pump out in the next couple of years, a lot of new evidence, which, um, you know, if we do it, if that's done right, and the communication and packaging up of that evidence is really made relevant to policymakers. It stands to really start to inform and kind of fertilize that conversation uh, with government. Um, obviously, we're going to have a new government at some point. Um, who knows who will win the election? But one way or another, there's going to be a moment in a year or so's time when it's going to be a bit of a right we've got a new period now and let's think again about about what the opportunities are around food so I think having that evidence really coming through at that point will yeah. be hugely valuable um we're pretty much out of time there are a couple of other chinks of light one is the yeah. food standards agency has been doing its nice sure, sure. yeah I agree Earth with that school food that's moving yeah. in the right direction um uh and I think we had the first food security assessment report, which came out December 2021. Well, yeah. The next one is due December 2024. And I think what we what they said a year ago is that that report will assess progress on this food strategy and involve the FSA and the Office for Environmental Protection and the Climate Change Committee, which all feels like potentially quite an exciting process to... Yeah. Uh, you know, report to Parliament on are we going in the right direction on some of these big food system change issues. So we should all think about how we use that mechanism effectively to push things in the right direction. Um, but Bob, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Thank My you worries. so much. And um, thank you to everybody for joining. Um, we always welcome your feedback. The, the webinar is recorded, so um, you can share it with anyone that you uh, think would be interested to hear it. And if, you're, if you want to hear more of our stuff, don't forget our award-winning podcast, which you can find on Spotify. Um, fantastic to see you, Bob, and uh, Thanks, see everybody Anna. again soon. Yeah, Great to see you, you. And, and, and thank you for everybody for, for joining and, and have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, have a great day.